This season proved that we were wrong about Nick Crawl from last offseason. You are Locked On Red, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into Locked On Reds. My name is Jeff Carr, and I'm glad that you're alongside me here today. I've loved this Reds team since birth. Seriously, I've got the baby pictures to prove it, and I've been hosting this show now on to my seventh off season. I am also the channel manager for the Locked On MLB channel, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every single day. And I want to make Locked On Reds for everybody because it's about the Reds, and for Reds fans that know what happened, they want to know why? And on today's show, I'm glad that you're along with me today because we are going to look at Nick Crawl's performance from this past season. Because last offseason, Steve and myself loved what he did. And this season proved us wrong about that. I'm going to get into why that is. I'm going to get into what the uh, syllabus, because we're talking grades and all that stuff here on today's show, what the syllabus for this offseason will be. And the one thing that he cannot control, but Nick Crawl is definitely on the hook for. That's on this episode that is brought to you by Prize Picks. Download the app today and use the code LOCKDOWNMLB to win $50 instantly when you play your first $5 lineup. Prize Picks, run your game. And where we will begin today is with Nick Crawl's performance in 2024 and why it proved us completely wrong after last offseason. Last offseason, Steve and myself, we were, were bullish on what Nick Crawl did, the, the moves that he made. I gave him a B plus to an A minus. Steve gave him a B to a B plus. So okay, but we weren't like, you know, love you know, saying that it was like absolutely perfect, but we gave him a good grade. And quite frankly, he probably deserved more like a C plus. Maybe a B minus. I mean, maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm being a little bit too hard, a little bit too negative looking back on last season. But let's talk about this because, all right, last top season, Jamer Candelario, big ticket guy. Mm. Frankie Montas was the answer in the rotation. Hmm. <laughs> and then Emilio Pagan, well, he was the answer in the bullpen. Yeah, and you, none of those really panned out. But that's not going to, just because those guys didn't completely pan out, that's not why I want to knock him here. It was the strategy for the moves that he didn't make because there was no outfield help at all. They bet on guys to just get better. And quite frankly, that didn't happen. And really, the bet that they made, on Jake Fraley, on Will Benson, on TJ Friedel, on Spencer Steer. The bet they made on all those guys is kind of based off of a small sample size and based a little bit on hope. Yeah, you know, we always love to say, and, you know, shout out to our friend Chad Dotson over at the Riverfront. Hope is not a strategy when it comes to running the Cincinnati Reds, running a professional baseball team. We can hope as fans, but Nick Crawl's job is not to hope. Nick Crawl's job is to eliminate variables, and he did not do that last offseason. That's the biggest reason that I want to go back and at least, you know, the hindsight grade for 2024 for Nick Crawl should be lower than what we gave him last offseason. As we were heading into spring training, we loved what he did, but we were wrong. Because he did not remove the variables that had been there all off season. The biggest need was the outfield. And, and, you know, you needed a starting pitcher to help stabilize the rotation. You needed some more bullpen arms because guys like Alexis Diaz and Ian Jabot were just overtaxed as much as they pitched in 2023. And uh, while Alexis Diaz didn't get hurt, Ian Jabot didn't pitch at all in 2024. So you needed that help. And he went and he got rotation help, albeit he got a guy who just had his arm reattached. I say that, you know, colloquially. Um, Frankie Montas coming off of shoulder surgery, and he only pitched one inning in 2023. So it's not as if we knew he was the stabilizing force for this rotation. It was a gamble. 
Emilio Pagan had a solid year, but it was a bit of an outlier given the rest of his career with the Twins and with a couple of other teams. So there was a, a, a bit of a question mark attached to him. Can he continue to be that good? He dealt with injuries all year. That's part of this, but that's definitely not Nick Crawl's fault. But it's, it's Emilio Pagan was not the back end of the bullpen guy that we were all looking for. And then Jamer Candelario at the time was a surprise signing because the Reds had so many infielders as it were. There were plenty of injuries and Jamer Candelario ended up having ample opportunity to play, but he wasn't the outfielder. And while the market wasn't teeming with plenty of outfielders out there, the Reds didn't go get anybody. No, and not, not even a flyer. I remember Michael A. Taylor was out there, and while he did not have a good year for the Pittsburgh Pirates, he was out there. Could have been in the mix for the Reds. He was a better fielder than anybody that the Reds had in the outfield. Uh, so there, there was a lot about this that was like, all right, money was spent, but was it spent wisely? And my grade of a B plus, and quite frankly, I said B plus or A minus just kind of depends on how the season went. The season went poorly and it was lower than a B plus. So that, that, that was just a little bit too excited on my part. And then with all the injuries that happened, this is where Nick Crawl really gets dinged is the off season itself was okay. It wasn't great, but it was okay. And then when all the injuries started happening in spring training, the only move that they made to really cover any of that was Santiago Espinal, which was fine. Espinal filled in admirably. There's a lot of folks that want to really pump up everything that he did and make it seem as though he needs to be a staple on this team for years to come. And I don't agree with that. But I, I, I appreciate the work that he put in for the Reds in 2024. But with that being said, that was it. That was all he did. That was the only move that Nick Crawl made. Ian Jabot goes down. There was no bullpen help that came. The outfield continued to look like a problem. They didn't do anything about it. And when Matt McClain tore his labrum, the thought on that was, well, he's going to rehab. He's going to be back. And that was a bad bet. That was hope. That was the biggest problem for me. It stems back to the hope of Will Benson taking a step forward. The hope of Jake Fraley taking a step forward. The hope of Spencer Steer. All of this stuff. It's hope. They cannot hope. Now. Because 2025 needs to be a playoff season. 2025, we need to see the step forward. Because while we were bullish that that should have happened in 2024, we were clearly ahead of the curve. We were clearly not ahead of the curve. We clearly put the, the, the cart in front of the horse when it came to this team. But now the cart's with the horse. Now we are where they said the timeline would be a couple of years ago. We are where... The entire fan base has been here for 30 years waiting for them to move in the postseason. It's time. And, and, and if they're going to sit there on their hands and just say we're waiting for development, there's a lot of fans that they're going to lose if they keep doing that. So you got to be aggressive. So I've got a syllabus for them. Because while we might have given Nick Kroll too high of a grade this past year, Got a syllabus form for them to pass. See, you follow this syllabus for this offseason, you're going to pass. We'll talk about that coming up next. Are you already out of it in your fantasy football league? Get back into it with Prize Picks, America's number one daily fantasy sports app. And it's so easy to see why they are the number one daily fantasy sports app because you can win up to 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks in an entry. All you have to do is you pick your four favorite players and your favorite statistics. You get a hunch. You think Joe Burrow is going to hit more on the passing yards. Think Jamar Chase is going to hit more on the touchdowns. 
pick them, put them all together in an entry and see your money multiply. Like I said, you could turn $10 even into a thousand dollars pretty easily. Download the prize picks app today and use the code locked on MLB and get $50 instantly. When you play $5, you don't even have to win. That's code L O C K E D O N M L B to get $50 instantly. When you play $5, that's over at prize picks run your game. We are talking Cincinnati Reds baseball here today, all day, every day, every week, every month, all year long. Make sure you subscribe to get at least 30 minutes of red stock in your feed every single day. And I mentioned, you know, looking back hindsight's 2020, when it comes to what Nick crawl did in 2024, we gave him too high of a grade going into spring training, looking at what he did last off season. So how does he succeed this off season? talking about grades and all this other stuff. It's like, well, you know, we'll give you a little bit of a a syllabus as it were a rubric. This is how you do it. You know how you, you at least guarantee yourself a passing grade. I don't even know. I do not foresee an off season that should be given a passing grade for Nick crawl. If they do not go out and get a bona fide outfielder. Now you you can you can explain it to me maybe like okay maybe it's Jerks and Profar maybe it's not a power hitting guy, uh, you know maybe it's not Teoscar Hernandez or maybe it's not Anthony Santander. Okay, who is it? Did they trade for somebody? Did it's got to be a bona fide guy? You don't get a passing grade in this off season if the Reds don't add a bona fide outfielder. Quite frankly, we've been talking about the outfield for years and years and years. And as much as I said in the last segment that we've known about this since at least last off season that the Reds really needed help in the outfield, it's been a while since the outfield has been settled. Like at least 10 years. <laughs> at least, maybe even more because I go back to 2013 and they go, they go get Marlon bird or maybe it was 2014. I don't know. They all run together. But the point is the, the reds front office, whether it's Nick crawl or someone else has always gone out and either gotten somebody who's like a little bit off the radar or completely off the beaten path and saying, that's going to be our guy. That's going to be our answer to the outfield. Just go get somebody who is a bona fide answer. That's how you get at least a passing grade this offseason. Let me let me dive into this a little bit further because I know that there are some folks that have aren't necessarily sold on my idea that the outfield is the biggest need. Let's start with this. The one statistic that when it comes to, I wouldn't say it's the end-all, be-all, it's a beginning of understanding. When it comes to a player's performance, that is wins above replacement war. The Reds outfield as a whole in 2024 had 0.9 war. There were only four teams in major league baseball. One of them was the white Sox, And quite frankly, they better be below you. If, if you're anybody in the major leagues, but four teams were below the Reds in outfield war. That's it. The Reds as a unit, we're talking about everybody who played in the outfield as a unit did not combine for one war. They were less than one war. Basically, the entire outfield for the Reds was replacement level. That means, and and just in case you're unfamiliar with the term, wins above replacement means that a given player, or in this case, a group of players, was worth so so much more than anyone else out on the open market that you can go get. So in this case, the entire group of outfielders for the Cincinnati Reds were barely better than any old other outfielder you could have went and found that was on the unemployment list. That's tough. And, and there's, there's more like, look, you want to, you want to look at that one stat and say, well, that's one stat. Let's look at a couple of other ones. Batting average, which I know some people love to harp on and others like to point out there's more stats to focus on. I'm more in the camp of, 
there's more, but this is the beginning of understanding when it comes to the outfield. The outfield batting average collectively for the Reds was 221. There was only two teams that had a lower batting average in the outfield than the Reds. And one of them was the White Sox. So really, the Reds were like the second worst team. Like the White Sox were so bad last year that to say that you were better than the White Sox at something, that ain't really saying anything at all. There was only one other team outside of the White Sox that the Reds had a better batting average in the outfield. That's sad. OPS, on-base plus slugging. Reds outfield, 682. Good for 24th in Major League Baseball. Their home runs, they had 55 home runs as an outfield. Guy here playing in the World Series coming up in a few days, Aaron Judge, (laughs) did that pretty much by himself. Reds were 17th in Major League Baseball in home runs. And we've talked about this before. They play in a ballpark that is just absolutely welcoming to the home run. So that alone gets them out of the out of the 20s in this ranking, but it doesn't get them much further because they just didn't have any pop. And then defensively, people differ on good statistics when it comes to fielding just because there really isn't a good way to quantify it. You know good fielding when you see it, but when you talk about like numbers wise that's hard to really describe. But there are two statistics that you talk about with fielding that everybody considers gospel. Defensive run saves and outs above average. As far as defensive run saves go, the Reds outfield had negative 10. That was good for 23rd in Major League Baseball. I I just, they weren't good at the plate. They weren't good in the field. They weren't good. The Reds need to fix this. They cannot just go into this offseason assuming, well, they had a bad year. You know, Will Benson, he had a bad year. He's going to get better. Jake Fraley had a solid year batting average-wise. Didn't really have a good year power-wise. He'll get better. In fact, Jake Fraley might be one of those guys on the non-tender list that we'll talk about here in a couple of weeks. But, you know, TJ Friedel, he'll be good. He'll be healthy next year. There's a lot of bad bets that you can make about this outfield. You know what a bad bet is not? Going out and getting a bona fide guy. Go get a bona fide outfielder. That is the biggest key to having a passing grade this offseason. Now, if you want a perfect grade, you're going to get two outfielders, and you're going to get a, a maybe a starting pitcher and maybe a bullpen guy. They don't have to be top end of the rotation type guys. And... I, I would like to see like a back end of the rotation type pitcher for the starting side. And then on the relief side, give me a bona fide like eighth inning guy, eighth or ninth inning guy. And, and, and maybe Graham Ashcraft becomes that, but don't make that part of the plan unless you're just going to come out and announce it like they probably should. But that's, that's the key here. The Reds need outfield help and they need some pitching depth to help out with the injuries that they've suffered already and just help out with the bullpen a little bit. Everybody needs bullpen help. There's, I mean, that's to say that they don't need bullpen help would be a uh, short side, but you're not getting a passing gray without going out and get a bona fide outfield. This team needs it so badly, but you know, wrapping things up, uh, there's one aspect of how he will be judged that Nick Crawl cannot completely control. You can get a big return this NFL season over on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. When you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play by play, and so much more all on the same place where you place your bets over at FanDuel. And plus, you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet, i.e. you don't even have to win. You place a $5 bet, you get $200 in bonus bets. The World Series is set. And look, regardless of how much we all hate the Dodgers and the Yankees, I think we can all agree that we're, uh, you know, seeing Shohei Otani and Aaron Judge in the World Series is objectively cool. With that, FanDuel has interesting odds set on the World Series 
going to seven games. Right now it's at plus 190. So wagering $10 would get you $19 if the World Series did in fact go to seven games. And look, I want more baseball. So yes, I want that to happen. Let's go over six and a half games. That's over on FanDuel.com. Make sure to take us with you when you can't watch us on YouTube. We are on every podcast app out there, so make sure you subscribe. All right, let's wrap this up. We've been talking about Nick Kroll, looking back on last offseason and how we gave him too high a grade. We, we fixed that now. We're looking back on that. Got to knock it down a peg. Told you how he can pass this offseason and how he could get a perfect grade if he just goes out and gets a couple of guys. But there's something about this that he cannot completely control. He kind of controlled it because he put the guys in the position. Because a couple of years ago, the Reds overhauled their development staff. They decided that at least for the pitching part of things, D Derek Johnson was going to run things from the major league side, kind of come up with a game plan, a developmental plan for the entirety of the organization. And I believe they started that with Joel McKeithen, but the Reds were so bad at the major league level that they decided to get rid of Joel McKeithen. So whoever's coming in, I bet, kind of inherits that sort of situation too. But the idea was a cohesive message when it came to development because the Reds have been so very sporadic with developing players really over my entire lifetime. It's been a while since they've been really consistent at developing guys. I mean, you got to go back to pre free agent time when you're really talking about the reds developing a consistent roster or at least the early days of free agency. They just haven't done it with any sort of consistency. So that's really where the focus is. And as much as it, it, it pains us as reds fans to hear that this team is about drafting and developing players. They, they build from within. We all hate hearing that, right? But that's kind of how it's going to be. Where the Reds are, market size. We're going to hear that a lot, by the way. <laughs> Get ready for that. World Series, New York and L.A., we're going to hear market size a lot. And the Reds just can't compare to either one of those when it comes to market size. So until there's a salary cap, until there's a salary floor in Major League Baseball, the Reds are kind of slaves to their own market. So we're never going to see them have a $300 million payroll. But what they can do is they can fill the holes in their roster with certain guys from free agency and certain guys that they trade for. But the core, the bulk of their talent will come from developed players. And so what Nick Crawl cannot completely control is how the team develops those players. But quite frankly, he is very much on the hook for it. Because he put the guys in place. Hopefully he put the right guys in place. There have been so many bad drafts. And and I think that I want to start this. And I, you know, our, our former Locked On MLB Prospects host, Lindsey Crosby, I think he and I would have a good discussion about this because I think he agrees with me. But I don't think there's such a thing as bad drafts. Now you, you could get duped and your scouts just don't know what they're talking about and you, you pick a bad talent. But I think it's pretty easy to spot elite high school and college talent. What's hard and what's almost impossible is translating that talent to major league talent. That's why the Reds have been so bad at it here recently. They haven't had the right guys. They haven't had the right development staff to help these guys along. Teams like the Guardians, teams like the Brewers do. And, and, and you, you can expand that to other teams. In fact, the Dodgers, for as much as they can spend on their roster, they also have elite development as well. Because who's always in the conversation for best farm system? L.A., the Dodgers, not the Angels. So that, that's a big part of this. And quite frankly, if you listen to our friends over at Locked On Angels, John Frisch and Mike Frisch, the Frisch brothers, they would tell you that the Angels have historically bad development. And that's why they're in the position that they're in. Because they just can't develop anybody. You can have good drafts, quote unquote. 
You can get good talent, but how you turn that talent into major league talent is what separates teams like Cleveland and Milwaukee from teams like Cincinnati and the Angels, the LA Angels. There's this feeling that just because the Reds don't spend, they're going to lose. And as much as I want to agree with that, There's an element to it that it's about developing the guys that they have. But here's the problem. Let's let's build a list of elite hitters that the Reds have developed. Let's just say last 10 years. Let's not go too far back. I mean, it's Joey Votto. Yeah, Jay Bruce. They traded for Brandon Phillips. No, no. Uh, well, okay, let's let's go 20 years. 20, 20 years. See what I'm getting at? A lot of the guys that they go for are guys that they have to acquire. Or a lot of a lot of guys that that they are driven by. A lot of guys that lead this team are guys that they have to acquire. Nick Castellanos a couple of years ago, obviously, acquired through free agency. Mike Moustakas was supposed to be that guy, but he he didn't, it, the Reds were too late for that. Scott Rowland was on the other side of his prime in his career. Big reason why the Reds went to the playoffs. Anytime the Reds needed a left fielder during the early 2010s, it was Mr. Outside Hire. Johnny Gomes, Ryan Ludwig. Anytime they needed a shortstop, it was Mr. Outside Hire, Orlando Cabrera, Edgar Renteria. There, there was just too many players that they had to acquire to build teams. They need to be able to develop. And that's the part that Nick Crawl does not have as much control over of that he would like, but it's going to be the biggest part of what makes or breaks him as the Reds president of baseball ops. Because he's told us, as as much as we don't want to hear, the Reds have to build from within. We hate hearing that because we think it's a cop-out. We think that that just means they're not going to spend any money. But what he's telling you is, when they don't build from within, there's no reason to go spend that money because they would have to spend on an entire new roster, and they don't have the resources to do that. As much as we would want that. You can't do that. You could do it in the MLB of the show. Can't do it in real life. And there's another conversation to be had about ownership and what that means and and why that, you know, shouldn't the Reds just have new owners? Yeah, you could go there. But sports ownership is not like managing a front office or managing a dugout. Just because you don't have X doesn't mean you get fired. Because the Castellinis are far from the worst owners in baseball. They're far from the worst owners in sports. It's just how ownership works. You get a team, and, and as fans, if, if we own the team, it would be a passion project. But we don't have enough money to do that. And I think that Bob Castellini, to an extent, this is a passion project for him. But he only has X amount of dollars to do it. He's not Steve Cohen. He's not whoever all is part of the Dodgers ownership group. There's like a whole bunch of people. He's not Steinbrenner. So what he can do is limited. And what Nick crawl has to do is make sure that he develops and he's got the right guys in place to develop a winner. It's going to be tough because the reds, they have to hit on the guys that we have been excited about. And while many of them took a step back this past season, they got to see them take a step forward this season and maybe even two steps forward so that we can get where we want to be. But that'll wrap us up for this edition of Lifetown Reds. Thanks as always for making us your first listen every single day. Make sure you check out Lockdown MLB for your second listen. Got a link in the description of today's episode so that you don't have to go searching for it because Sully's got you covered all throughout the playoffs with his knowledge of the game, both past and present, and his a little bit of witty humor that'll probably drop in there as well. Lockdown MLB is just like Lockdown Reds. 
It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts, and we are all part of the podcast, the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every single day. But remember that we will be locked on Reds every single day.